Welcome back. Let us continue and move to chapter 4, linked lists. We will study this chapter along five different sections, beginning by talking about the local versus the dynamic memory, which are the stack and the heap. Then we will introduce linked lists and what they are. And then we will uh, study seven code techniques from Nick Parlamp to master the operations over linked lists. And then we will see the operations over linked lists, some of them, and we will continue the others in the exercise session. And finally, we will end the chapter with introducing some different variants of linked lists. So let us begin. As usual, you can check the description box to see the different parts of the video and to go to the playlist of this course. So let us begin by section one, local versus dynamic memories, stack and heap. Local memory, also called the stack, is the most commonly used memory in programming because it is automatic. It behaves as a first in last out buffer. So as we have seen until now, when we draw the memory state, we only show you the stack memory. And you know that the first function that runs is the last that to be deallocated. So this memory uses a register, which is called the stack pointer, in order to follow where we are now in the execution of the program. The variables allocated on the stack are stored directly there they benefit from fast access and they are called the locals of some block. Their lifetime is tied to the function where they are declared. It means when the function runs, they are automatically allocated and when the function exits, they are automatically deallocated. Let's take an example. Let's consider this function called square, which returns an integer and takes as input another integer. It takes the integer num and the result is the multiplication of num by itself and it returns this result. So here in this function we have two locals which are int num and int result. So num and result are the locals of the function square. Whenever we call square they are automatically allocated. Whenever square returns they are automatically deallocated and freed from the stack memory. And we did so until now. So this is the memory state, and this is the stack, and this is the square function space. And here are the locals of the square function, which will be automatically and deallocated and deallocated. Let us move now to the ampersand bug program which will be explained here to demonstrate the importance of the memory. Let us consider the function victim, which is a victim function of some function tab that we will see now. Victim declares a pointer of base type int and apparently assigns a pointer to the returned value by the function tab and then tries to dereference this pointer and put some value in the pointee. Until now, nothing is wrong because the pointer is supposed to point somewhere after the second instruction. However, let us see tab. Of course, tab will return a pointer of base type int in order to be assigned to PTR. However, it will return the address of some local variable temp inside its space. So if we want to see this, this is victim and this is PTR and this is tab inside the space of tab. We all know that tab will return and when it returns, all its local will automatically be deallocated since they live inside the stack. So at the moment where tab returns the address of temp, temp will stop to exist and pointer will be fooled that it points to somewhere, whereas the operating system has already freed this local. So whenever you will reach this instruction and try to put 42 inside the content of PTR, the operating system will prevent this operation and will tell you this access is denied. 
Don't ever try this code and by getting lucky only tell me that this works for you. It's like that you have managed to enter the neighbor's house without them being there for the moment, but sooner or later they will come and they will deliver you to the police. If you need victim to stop being a victim and to allocate a memory that will stay there after you exit, you need to work with the dynamic memory, which is the heap. So for now we have two kinds of memories which both are inside the RAM, the local memory which is called the pack that we all know and the new memory that we are introducing now which is the dynamic memory or called also the heap. So let us represent them by the following schema. The stack is the last in first out buffer whereas the heap is a big memory space presenting blocks for rent for anybody who wants to use some memory space that is free to him. So consider the dynamic memory as a duty-free space available for everybody. So the local memory is used for static memory allocation and by static we already explained that it is automatic allocation and deallocation whereas the dynamic memory is used for dynamic memory allocation. So in the stack memory, the allocation is automatic, the variables are allocated and deallocated automatically on function, call and exit, whereas in the heap memory, nothing happens automatically. You have to explicitly request the allocation and then explicitly request the deallocation of the memory. So this is for advanced users, this is for expert programmers. This thing has advantages and disadvantages. And as you can guess, the advantages are that the lifetime of the variables is controlled. The variables are not deallocated automatically, so you can guess that you can have more control over their lifetime. Their size also, you have more control over it, and this gives you greater control of memory and greater pleasure. The disadvantage, however, are that you have to explicitly do everything. It will lead to more work, and if you work more, of course, you will have more mistakes, so this will lead also to more bugs, which is a greater responsibility. So this is the dynamic memory, and we will now explain how to use it. So the dynamic allocation functions, in order to use them, you have to include the stdlib.h. So heap is a shared memory. You can use it using the functions, the core of allocation system, which are the malloc and the free functions. The malloc allocates memory from portion of remaining free memory. Suppose this is the heap and you need a memory in the heap, you call malloc. Free, it is the opposite. When you finish with the memory block you have allocated using malloc, you call free to release the memory and return it to the system and so may be reused to satisfy future allocation requests since the heap is a shared memory. So with free, the memory you have allocated will be freed. Let's examine now the allocation function malloc. The program can explicitly request areas or blocks of memory for use by calling the function malloc, which reserves in heap a block of memory of requested size and returns a pointer to it. So malloc takes one parameter and returns a void pointer. This one parameter is of type size underscore t, a type which we have already seen in the return type of size of operator, and in which, uh, this is a positive number, uh, you indicate uh, how many bytes you need in the heap. Of course, malloc will return a void pointer, which you will need to cast in order to use the allocated memory for specific reasons. 
So for example, let us consider our pointer of base type int for which we want to allocate in the heap an array of 50 integer. So this is the instruction ptr receives malloc 50 times size of int cast it to int star in order to be used as an array of 50 integers. Let me draw your attention that the memory block that was allocated has no label like we used to have in the stack. For example, this memory block uh, is the variable ptr which has the label ptr. The memory blocks allocated in the heap are only pointed to and they have no names. So the only solution to access them is through the pointers that were assigned their memory when they were allocated. Okay, and if this memory block is an array, you access it like usual. If this is a structure, you dereference using the arrow operator. If this is a normal variable, you dereference using the dereference operator, which is the asterisk. Before you start using this memory block, you have to make sure it was really allocated. And when the malloc function tried to allocate it, it really found an available space. In the contrary, it will return null. So you have to check if the pointer is null, you cannot use it because it was not really uh, given a memory in the heap. Let us examine now the deallocation. Suppose you have successfully allocated your pointer and you finished using it after some time and you want to return it to the heap to be a proper a programmer, responsible programmer that does not overuse unnecessary space. And this is because you yourself, next time, if you want to allocate a memory, you would love to find the needed memory. So to do so, you will use the free function, which takes the pointer, the address, which you want to free. And this is a void function. So if the program finished using a block of memory, it must make an explicit deallocation request. This is from his responsibility to indicate so to the heap manager, which will update its private data structure to indicate that this block is available for next time. So for example, we will free this uh, space by calling free ptr. And this time, the heap manager knows how much space it was allocated. So you don't need to give the size to be freed. The heap manager will remember how many bytes it has to free. So as you can see, when you free, uh, the block disappears from the heap. It is available for next use, but the pointer will still have the address of the block that was freed. So you have to remember to reset the pointer that is in the stack after the three. You have to assign a null value to your pointer in order not to be fooled that it is not null while it doesn't point any useful memory block. Put ptr equal null and the arrow will disappear from ptr and you will have your null value inside your variable. This is more proper. Never call free with an invalid argument. Never call, for example, free null or free whatever pointer. You don't know what memory block it points. Maybe it points to the stack variables, etc. This will destroy the free list. So you know now how to allocate and deallocate in the heap. And you must know that this is mostly used for the linked lists. But before that, let us finish this section by doing a small exercise. So exercise, allocate and fill. Write a program which define a structure type student with a name and six marks, asks for the exact number of students, and then asks a function to allocate and fill in the heap an array to hold the student's info and fill their info from the keyboard. So this is to demonstrate the use of the heap. You just allocate the size you need. If there are five students, you allocate an array of five elements. 
and this is can only be known after you ask the user how many students you have. And then this program must ask another function called average to calculate and return the class average. And after uh, calling this function, the program must display the class average and then free the dynamic memory because this is a proper program. So let us begin working by defining the structure type student. So type def struct student which holds a name and an array of six marks or six grades and this can be double float integer whatever after declaring this structure type your program must ask for the exact number of students so my program will call type def my program will call, for example, alloc std test, which is another function. Void function in which my program will operate. So I have to ask the, for the exact number of students student number print f exact number of students Can F person D and STD and B. And now that we have the number of students, we will ask a function alloc and fill to allocate in the heap an array and not like the tab victim uh, example, it will allocate in the heap an array to hold the students info. So please, I will call alloc and fill, and when it will finish allocating, it will return me an array of students. So I will declare the students array to be ready to receive when I call alloc and fill. So std equal a lock fill and the number I was given. <coughs> Let us define a lock fill. So a lock fill will return an array of students or a pointer to student in the heap it needs the size of the array to be allocated and fill so with the size what we will do we will declare a pointer ptr to which we will allocate not in star but student star an array using malloc however malloc in order to use it you must include stdlib.h so student malloc how many students do we need we need size times size of student exactly and then we will cast this to student star and then 
we when we finish we will return this address so the heap will be holding the array okay we never allocate something in the heap if we don't need it so uh, this is why the function is called alloc and fill you never allocate if you don't want to fill because why the rush when you need to fill you will be allocating so here we will be filling so I will declare an integer i and I will loop over my array for i equals 0 i less than size i plus plus and I will uh, fill my uh, my array ptr of i equal so what I have to fill it as a structure I have to fill the name and the marks from where the program says you have to fill them from the keyboard so I will open the for loop and I will scan from the keyboard in order to fill name and six marks and then I will read the name using f gets f gets where do you want to read you will read inside the name where is name inside ptr of i so ptr of i dot name 30 characters from std in and then you will read six marks so this is another for loop So this is another for loop over j for example and then inside ptr of i of marks of j. This is how you fill your grades. After you have uh, read all your marks and names, you will return your array, the location inside the heap. And this is a log fill. Ask another function average to calculate and return the class average. So let us ask this function average here after you allocate and fill. We will declare a double avg inside which we will put the class average. avg receives average of what? Of the array that is called stds, which size is std and b. So let's write this function. double average which takes an array of students with its size loop over this array just like we did before and calculate the class average So here we will loop in order, we will declare the average double avg equal 0, 0.0 and then we will loop over the array in order to Summate the marks and then the class average is nothing but AVG divided by six times 
the size so here is my program this is not PTR this is STDS and this is it uh, okay I have to read not a person D I have to read a person long float and what else do we have as mistakes nothing else and later the program has to display the class average and to free the dynamic memory so we will display the class average the class average is percent lf avg let us put backslash and in order to be very neat okay and later before we finish our program we have to free the space we can free it even from a function that didn't allocate it so this is very easy free stds this is our program let us run so we correct the for loop for the j um, and then we have this execution of the program so we reach section 2 linked lists linked lists are useful for two reasons the first is that they are data structure used in real programs and the second is that it gives appreciation of time space code issues which is useful to thinking about any data structure in general so in order to learn more complex data structure you need to learn linked list and you need to learn linked list by itself because you can use it in real programs this is a great way to learn about pointers with linked lists you will know the importance of a pointer the problems are a nice combination of algorithms and pointer manipulation so why linked list after all the use of linked list is similar to the arrays they are both used to store collections of data However, they differ in strategies. What is the array strategy? The array strategy is that you entirely allocate the array at once. The entire array is allocated as one block of memory. And then to access each element, you can access them directly using the bracket syntax. The linked list strategy is that the memory allocation for each element separately only when necessary you don't allocate for an element unless you use this element unless you need this element however the access is more complex we list three disadvantages of arrays the first is the fixed size which is can be specified at compile time and even if it is deferred until the run time after that it remains fixed we did so, uh, we deferred the array size until runtime in the previous exercise. The second disadvantage is that you have always to allocate a large enough array and most of the time 70% of the space is wasted. And even so, if you need one more space, the code will break. So, and uh, allocating large enough arrays is the habit of many commercial codes. This is not an exception. This is the habit of the programmers. You can tell me that we can allocate an array in the heap and then we can dynamically resize it with real log. Yes, but which will remind us the third, the third disadvantage of an array, even if you do so, Inserting new elements at the front of an array is expensive. Why? Because existing elements need to be shifted over to make room. Suppose you have your array and you want to alter one element. You have to insert an element in the front of the array. You need to shift all the elements 
in order to make this room. So this is an expensive operation and that's why we prefer linked lists. So what linked lists look like? We define a node. A node is a linked list element. Linked lists gets its overall structure by using pointers to connect all its nodes together like links in a chain. How? Each node contains two fields, the data field and the next field. The data field is here to store whatever element type the list holds for its client. So after all, you have a linked list in order to hold data, so the data field is here for that. The next field is used as a pointer to link one node to the next node. This is the node definition, uh, an example of node definition. Suppose the data field is an integer. So the node definition will be struct node in data. And the other field is of type struct node star. So struct node star and we call it next. Each node will be allocated in the heap using a malloc. You don't allocate all the nodes with one malloc like we do for arrays. You uh, use a malloc call for each of the nodes. And each node will continue to exist until an explicit free call will be used. How do you hold your list? You hold your list by a pointer to the first node. So this is the shape of your linked lists. It will be connected nodes. From each node, there is a next field to point to the next. You only need to know the address of your first node in the heap in order to reach your list. Let us take a more concrete example and see this list, which is of consisting of nodes 1, 2, 3. The overall list is built by connecting the nodes together by their next pointers. We see here three nodes in the heap of type node, each containing two fields, of course, data and next, data and next. The data fields contains one, two, and three. The next node of each node, the next field of each node points to the next node. So this gives the structure of a linked list. The nodes are all allocated in the heap. However, you point to the first node from a variable in the stack. For example, here the variable head, which is a pointer to the first node. Of course, as you can see, the next field of the last node will be pointing to nothing because this is the next node, so the next field will be set to null. What about an empty list? An empty list is a list with no nodes. List with zero nodes, and this will give us a null head pointer. So the head itself that is supposed to point to the nodes is null. Empty list case is a boundary case for linked list code. So every program that takes a list, a linked list as a parameter, a first case of this program, of this function, must be to check whether this list is empty or not. So this is a good habit to remember to check empty list case to verify that it works too. For example, you are writing a code to calculate the length of a linked list. Ask yourself, did I treat the case where my linked list doesn't contain any node? This is the end of our section, and next we will see seven code techniques from Nick Parland in order to know how to work with linked lists like professionals. So seven code techniques from Nick Parland. Nick Parland is a lecturer in the Stanford Computer Science Department, and a years ago he published this linked list problems document, which is very valuable and from which we will study the code techniques. So first, let's consider that we need to iterate down a list. How to do this? To iterate a pointer over all nodes in a list using a loop. Consider you have this linked list, one, two, three, and you need to write the function length 
which take a list head as parameter and need to count how many nodes there is in the list and return this count. So as we have said, you iterate a pointer over all the nodes in a list using a loop. You create a pointer and you make it point the nodes one after the other inside a loop. You copy the head pointer into a local variable current in order not to lose the head if you need it for later in the same function. Struct node star current, you declare current a pointer of type node star and you initialize it to take the same value as head. We will see now in an animation, this is only a schema to see. Then you test for the end of the list, you are doing a loop. So when do we stop? When the pointer that iterates the node will become null. So while the pointer current that we have created is not null, we keep looping. While current is different than null, we count. And then how to advance? You advance your pointer not by saying current plus plus, but by giving current the value of the next field that is pointed by current. Current receives current arrow next. So this is the third part. And those three parts teaches, teach us how to iterate down a list. You initialize current, you loop while it is not null, and you advance current inside the loop in order not to have an infinite loop. Another way, instead of using the while loop, you can use for loop. The for loop makes the initialization, the test, and the pointer advance harder to omit. You write them in the three parts of the for. And this is more concise and will make you forget less. This is the animation. So let us consider we have length test in which we have the head point pointing to the first node of three link, uh, list nodes. The third having the next field to null, of course. Length function has its own head, which is a copy of the original head. However, we can create another variable current into which we copy also head. If, suppose, you don't want to change the value of head inside your function length. And then current now also points to the first node. And you initialize count variable to zero. Since current is not null, it is pointing to something, you will increment count and then you will advance current to receive the next field's value where it points. So current was here, you take the next field that she points to and you put it now to be the value of current. So current and the next field have the same point T. It is still not null, so you increment count to 2 and you advance current. It is still not null, so you increment count to become 3. And you advance current, how? It will take this value, the value of the next field, current equal current arrow next. So this value happens to be null, so it will be copied to current. And this where the condition of the loop stops. Current is not not null, current is null now, so we stop the loop and we return count which is the value 3. There are three nodes in this linked list. Code technique number 2. Changing a pointer with a reference pointer. If a function need to change the caller's head pointer, you need to pass a pointer to the head pointer, which is a reference pointer. To change a node star, remember, you have to pass a node star star. We saw this in the chapter pointers and arrays. So, in the call, you have to pass the address of this pointer, and in the callee function, in order to access the value and, and of interest and change it, you have to dereference this pointer reference. 
Example, we will begin by a very easy example. Suppose you have two pointers, head one and head two, and for some reason, you need to put head one to be equal to null, also head two, but not from within the change test function, from within another function. So here you need to change the head one variable, so which is not star, you call change to null and you pass the address of head one to change to null. So this is head one and head two inside the scope of change test inside the stack. You need to put the null value here through change to null. Change to null has to receive a node star star head ref which will be pointing to head one and another call will be used to use another head ref to point to head two and through each head ref you dereference it to put null in the original variable. This is a very easy example set explicitly in order for you to understand that if you need to change the head you must use a node star star variable through which you dereference it and you change the head. In this example, the change was very easy. It was consisting of putting only a null value inside this variable. But whatever the change is, the technique is the same. The code technique number two says changing a pointer with a reference pointer. We will use this code technique to apply a special application on list building. If you want to build the list, suppose you don't have the list and you want to build it in the heap. Since it is consisting of nodes, you will have to allocate each node apart. The best solution is to use an independent function that adds a single node to any list. And you can call this function as many times as we want to build, out, to build up any list. The classic three-step link in operation states the following. It adds a single node to the front of a linked list. So suppose you have a linked list and the classic three-step operation says the following. Having a linked list with nodes allocated in the heap, we will add one node to those nodes at the head of the list. So the node that we will add will become the first node of the list. The three steps are allocate and fill, link next, and link head. Let us see them uh, closer. This will be written using the function push, which is a very famous function for linked lists, and that's why we will use a capital P for push in order to say that this is very important. What does push do? It adds a node to the head of the linked list. How the three-step link in operation are the following. Allocate and fill, which in which step you allocate the new node in the heap, and set its data to whatever needs to be stored. Of course, allocate and fill, we already mentioned this. Every time you allocate, this means you needed the, the space in the heap. If you needed it, so you have to fill it immediately. That's why the step is called allocate and fill. The next step is you have to link this node that you just created to the other nodes in the heap to make them one linked list and not the old linked list and only one node um, uh, alone. So link next will set the dot next pointer of the new node to point to the current first node of the list. Okay, so we will link the new node next value to the current first node. And the finally, we will link the head to indicate that the new node is now our first node. So you change the head pointer to point to the new node, so it is now the first node in the list. And in this third step, 
we need to change the head original value so we need a pointer to the pointer that's why we put push inside the second code technique of nectarlamp so this is our push function and as you can see it takes the data to be filled inside the new node and it takes a reference to the head and not a copy of the head the first is allocate and fill so you create a pointer new node in which you allocate one node node star to cast malloc size of node you fill directly new node arrow data equal d the second step is to link next so you will fill now new node arrow next to be equal to what to be equal to the old first node which is pointed to by the d reference of head ref so you copy d reference of head ref into the next field of new node and the third step is to link the head so you change the original head to be now equal to new node let us examine this using a memory state animation so this is our push function again it is consisting of only four lines very very concise push function and very effective push function let us examine the animation suppose we have the list one two three and we want to push the value zero to the head of the list so it becomes zero one two three so we will call push over the list and we will pass the value zero the initial state inside push test we have head which points to the first node in the heap which are is linked to the two others using the next field in each node and of course the last node next field is null this is the heap this is the stack let us see push if we call push we must pass the address of head and the value to be pushed so head ref inside push will be given the address of head so it will point to head and why we said already why because it needs to change the head and the value zero will be received in the variable d next the first step in the three steps is to allocate and fill so we create a pointer new node inside which we have the address that is allocated in the heap for a new node which we directly fill the data field to copy d so node star new node equal node star this is a casting for void star malloc size of one node i allocate one node this address is returned to be assigned to the new node pointer inside my stack of push and then the new node arrow data will be equal to zero but as you can see until now this node is not linked with the three existing nodes so what is the second step is to link the next field that is here to be referencing the first node why because our problem is to push this node in front of the others so i will have to write the next step new node arrow next equals what shall i put here the address of this node what is the address of this node where is it located it is inside head however I, I i cannot access head i am inside push but i have a reference to the head so i write new node arrow next receives d reference of head ref this is why we need to d reference head ref to copy this value here so now head and next field of new node both share the same pointy which is the old node of the linked list okay so what is the next step the next step is to tell head that 
you now have to know now that the first node is the one that I have just added. So step number three is to link head and how to dereference head ref and change the value here. Instead of pointing to the old first node, it must point now to the new node. So dereference head ref receives new node. Copy the value from here and paste it here. So head of push test, which is the dereference of head ref, and new node share now the same point key. And now the push function will return. This is a void function. All what it has to do has been done. The locals of the push function will die, will be automatically deallocated, but the nodes that are in the heap will remain living because they are not explicitly deallocated yet. So what will happen? The push and locals will disappear. However, the push test head will stay. It is changed now to point to the first node, the new first node, which is linked to the old first node, which are linked to the nodes of the list. So we have now, after the call to push returns, a linked list consisting of four nodes, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Code technique number three, build at head with push. The easiest way to build a list is to build up a list by adding nodes at its head and using the function push we just saw. The code is short and runs fast. The, that's why because lists naturally support operations at head end. Example, function add at head is supposed to build up a list of five nodes and return the address of the head. We declare head variable to be equal to null and this null is very very important because it will stay in the last next field of the nodes. So if you omit to write equal null here you will have many nightmares in your programming lives. Okay, so you declare struct node star head equal null and later you will return this head's value after you have allocated them in the heap. So what you will do next is to declare an integer i and to loop for example five times. Each time you will allocate one node. You will push one node to the heap. How? You call push over head push and head and you give i. The disadvantage of this easy technique is that the elements will be appearing in the list in reverse order that they are added. So here you are pushing one, then two in front of one, then three in front of two. You will have the list five, four, three, two, one. Here is the memory state of your code. So you have first uh, put in here inside head a null, then you have pushed a value, and then you copied the head value to the next field of the first node you have added, then you have pushed the node 2 in front of 1, the node 3 in front of 2, and so on until you have pushed 5 nodes. So as you have seen the animation of push in the previous code technique, you will have at the end of your loop i equal to 6 and head pointing to the first node, which is the last added node holding the value 5. In technique number 4, we would like to correct the reverse order we did in technique number 3, so we would like to build with the tail pointer which is to add the nodes at the tail end instead of adding them at the front end of list. So you will have to locate the last node in the list and change its dot next field from null to point to a new node. One exception is if the node is the first in the list. Suppose you have your head equal to null and you will have to add to the tail pointer. There is no tail, there is nothing yet. 
So in that case, the head pointer itself must be changed. So this is a normal push to an empty list. This is a special case of a general rule, for example, of many cases, insert or delete a node inside a list. For this, we need a pointer to the node that is just before that position so that we have to change its dot next field. So this is the code technique number four, is to go to the node before the node of interest. Many linked lists include the sub-problem of advancing a pointer to the node before point of insertion or deletion. How do we do this? We change the condition of the loop instead of saying for current not null, we say for current not null and the current arrow next is not null so that we stop at and before current becomes null. So we stop when current arrow next becomes null. This is how do we point to the last node. But we cannot write this condition without writing current without being sure that current is not null before dereferencing it with the arrow pointer, with the arrow operator. So that that's why we write the condition current is not null and and current arrow next is not null. And this is how we do. We have the three nodes, and suppose now we want to add the node containing the value 4 at the end of 1, 2, 3 to get 1, 2, 3, 4. We have the add to tail function inside which we declare a tail pointer for which we want to go to the last node. Okay, tail will point the last node and through tail arrow next we will change the next value to point to the new node. Okay, so tail arrow next will be equal to the new node and which we have already filled and set the next uh, field to null, to the old next value here. So this is the code technique number four. Code technique number five is the building of the list while deferring the special case of the first node from the rest of the nodes using a tail pointer. So you will build up the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 by appending the nodes to the tail end. Consider this function build with special case which will have to return at the last the head pointer to the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that is asked to be, in, to be built. Okay, so we will begin struct node star head equal null and then we will use now a tail pointer in order to build our list. We declare struct node star tail, which we will be using. And then the technique consists of two different cases. Every first node must be added at the head pointer. So we will do a loop, but this time the loop will go from 2 to 5. And the first node will be added at the head pointer. So we will call push over the head and we will put the value 1. This is the first case. The other cases, all other nodes will be inserted after the last node using the tail pointer. So we will update the tail now to be equal to head because after putting one node in our list, the last node in this list is this node tail equal to head and then from 2 to 5 we will push to the tail arrow next okay so we will push to end of tail arrow next and we will put the element i and each time we push the tail pointer must advance to point the last node that has just been pushed so tail equal tail arrow next this is a technique called called technique number five and the problem with this technique as you can see is you have two pushes one in blue and the others are in green 
The problem is that writing separate special case code for the first node is unsatisfying and we would love to put this line inside the for loop again. So this is a quick memory state to show you that using this technique, you will always have your tail pointer point to the last node in order for the next push to be uh, pushed over this next field. So you, you give push the address of tail arrow next and you will push considering that this is the head. So it will be pushed after the last node. Some programmers use this technique, which is called the technique of dummy node, in order to solve the problem, the disadvantage that was present in code technique number five. You remember in code technique number five, we had two different cases for the first node to be added to the list and the rest of the nodes. So uh, some programmers use a temporary dummy node at the head of the list during computation, which is during the local of the stack, you declare a structure node and not a structure node star, and you call it dummy because you will be leaving it later. And then you put in the next field of dummy, dummy.next, the null value, which is the empty list. And uh, the dummy node is temporarily the first node, so it will act as a temporal first node in order to remove the special case for the first node. And as you can see, we will begin now from i equal 1 and not from i equal 2. How? At the end, after you have built the list, you will return the dummy.next field value, which is the address of the real first node allocated in the heap. So the trick with dummy is that every node will appear to be added after a certain next field, even the first node, because you just created a dummy node in order to have a next field for the first node. The code for the first node is now the same as for the other nodes. So you create the tail pointer to be equal the first thing to add the address of dummy. And then you put all the code inside the for loop. You push into the address of tail arrow next, and you advance the tail to be equal tail arrow next. And at last, you will return your list. The tail pointer will play the same role as in the previous example, so it will handle also the first node. So here is the memory state you will create a dummy node inside the stack so that you put the next field will play the role of the head now so that you can join the two cases into one only case and you can always push the, fir the first time tail will be pointing to dummy so you will push into tail arrow next and the same second and third and fourth etc times will be the same. So at last when this build with dummy node finishes you will return the address of the first node which is nothing but dummy.next. That's why we return dummy.next at the end of this function. So this is the technique using dummy node. Some programmers use it. Let us see some remarks about this technique. You can keep the dummy node as a permanent part of the list. Previously, we have seen that dummy node is a temporary part of the list used inside the function in order to solve the problem. But some programmers keep it as a permanent part of the list, so they will declare the dummy node inside the heap instead of inside the stack. In this case, an empty list is not represented by a null pointer but by a pointer which next field is not. Every list has a dummy node as its head and algorithms will know that if you use dummy node technique, you will have to skip over the dummy node for all the operations, including counting, inserting, deleting, etc. 
The heap allocated dummy node is always present to provide the above sort of convenience in code. However, if you choose to use the dummy in the stack strategy, like the example in the previous slide, this is a little unusual, but it avoids making the dummy permanent part of list. Okay, this code technique I don't like, but I presented it so that you can understand whenever you see this technique over the net in the programs, you can understand what is code technique using a dummy node. Next, we will see my best code technique, which is code technique number seven. Code technique number seven, build using a local reference. How? You can, as we have seen before, unify all the node cases without using a dummy node. And how can we do this? Use a local reference pointer, which always point not to the last node, but to the last pointer in the list instead of the last node. And then the reference pointer starts off by pointing to the head pointer, which is the last pointer, because before uh, it is a, at start, it is an empty list. And then additions to the list will be made by following the reference pointer. Later, the reference pointer must point to the dot next field, which inside the last node in the list. So always the reference pointer will point to the last pointer in the list. Let us see how. So first use a local reference pointer. Struct node star star and we will call it last pointer reference. And first this pointer will start off by pointing to the head. So equal end head. Additions to the list are made by following the reference pointer, so you will add using push, and you will provide the last pointer reference to push into, and then this last pointer reference, we have used it to push a new node, so this last pointer reference must be updated to point the next field of the newly pushed node. So last pointer reference equal the address of the reference last pointer reference arrow next all of this. This is the code technique number seven. And of course, at the end, this is not if else case. This is one case without a dummy uh, node and without anything else. And you will have the list in order. Let us see. A quick memory state first last pointer reference will be pointing the head so the first push the head will have one node will be pointing to one node and then you will advance the last pointer reference to point to not the node but the to point to the next field in the node and so on every time you add a node and you advance the last pointer reference to point to the next field of your node. So that every time you will have your last pointer reference equal the address of the reference of last pointer reference arrow next. So this is, uh, we are back to the build with local reference code. And this code is the best code. It is a top choice award, mark of excellence code, because it is very concise and it uses a local reference. To advance our local reference, we use this syntax in green. I explicitly created this slide in order to draw your attention that the syntax is green in green, the effect of the syntax is not at all like the effect of if you have added the dereference operator over all the parts of the expression. So dereference ptr ref, if you have ptr ref a local reference of type node star star, do not confuse two different syntaxes which have very different behaviors. Okay? 
So the reference PTR ref equal the reference PTR ref arrow next is not the same thing as if you have put an arrow and and before the two expressions. It's not the same thing as PTR ref equal address of the reference PTR ref arrow next. So suppose this is the initial state of both expressions. I will now show you what is the effect of executing this expression over this state and what is the effect over, of executing this expression over this state. So let us see. Dereference PTR ref equal dereference PTR ref arrow next. So this is dereference PTR. This is PTR ref. This is to dereference and put the value here. What value you want to put? You want to put dereference PTR ref arrow next. So you want to copy this value here. So this is the effect. You change the value in this next field to be equal to this value. So you are skipping this node literally so the next will be the node holding the data 4 and the node holding the data 3 will be here in the heap nobody is pointing to it so you are you can use this syntax if you want to delete a node you can use this local reference syntax in order to delete a node but you need to free the skipped node so before that, you have to declare a node star term in which you save this value. And after you skip this node, you have to free this temp, uh, this temp address in order to be freed from the heap. Let's see now the effect of this syntax. This is used in the code technique number seven in order to make ptrf point to this field, to the next, next field. So ptrf equal, so the change will be here, equal what? Equal the address of what? Of the reference ptrf arrow next, the address of this. So this will be pointing here and not here anymore. In the section four, we will see operations over linked lists. The operations over linked list are many and we will study them in the exercise session. But let us state what we will be doing in the exercise session. Now that you have learned the code techniques and you have learned what are linked lists and how to iterate over linked lists, we will write problems like inserting elements in the middle of a linked list. For example, insert in the nth order, insert an element to be the nth element in this list or insert an element and to keep the list sorted if the list was already sorted or insert an element after another or before another all this is called functions that insert elements in the middle of linked list another kind of functions we can write a function remove first which given a linked list it will remove and free the first node of this linked list and of course update the head of this linked list or remove last or remove from the middle as we have did with insert in the middle or we can be asked to write a function to delete a complete list this needs a function because a simple free would not do it since we have allocated each node alone separately another kind of problems you will see them in the document of linked list problems of Nick Parland, and you have to study them all. As an example, let's consider the interesting function insert ends, which insert a new node at an index within a list. So you may specify an index in the range of zero to insert uh, at the head of the list until length to insert after the last node of the list. And the new node should be inserted so as to be at that index. So we will provide the insert and test, which is, for example, you construct an empty list, struct node head equal null. And if you call insert ends, 
and you provide end head of course we will provide the address of head because this may change the head if the note to be inserted is before the first node at index 0 the value 13 so we will, you have constructed the list while holding one element which is 13 if you call insert ends again at index 1 you want 42 this means 42 will be at index 1 after the index 0 so the list will become 13 comma 42 and if we call insert ends a third time this third time will be shown in a memory state in few seconds okay if you have 13 42 and you call insert ends and head 1 5 it means you want to insert the element 5 at index 1 it means 13 is an index 0 the element 5 will be at index 1 and now the element 42 will become at index 2 and after we try our program we will have to delete the list of course and because we have to clean up after ourselves so the interesting thing is how do we write insert ends look at me how easy and concise we can write insert ends using local references of course insert ends needs a head ref the index at which you want to insert and the data to be inserted it is a void function the base case is obvious if the index is negative you don't insert if the index is strictly positive but the list is empty you cannot insert at an index 1 while the list is empty so those two are both base cases if index is negative or at the same time index is positive but the list is empty so in those cases we will print f error insert is cancelled because the index is out of range this is the first base case what is the second base case the second base case if you are trying to insert at index 0 yes of course this is nothing but push so if index equal equal 0 you call push and you give it head ref and the data to be pushed and the third remaining case is that you are trying to insert at another place other than the first place which is by recursivity inserting at decrementing index from starting from the next node so look how we will write it insert but this time the head is nothing but the next field of the first node so you pass a reference to this head and of the reference head ref arrow next and the index will be decremented by one and the data to be inserted is the same so this is a very beautiful function it is very short and effective this is code technique number seven again let us see the execution of the third call to insert ends, which you are having 1342 and you call now insert ends and you provide the index one. You want to insert the element five at the index one as so to have the list 13542. So this is insert ends test and you have your head pointing to the node 13 and the node 13's next points to the node 42 whose next is 9 let us begin insert ends will receive head ref which will be pointing to head and the index and head is not null and the index is not negative or null so we will not be calling push we will be calling recursive call to insert ends with had ref this time having the value of d reference head arrow next the address and the index will be decremented by one and the data is the same the index here is zero so we will be calling push and head ref 
of push will receive head ref of insert ends so they will be always sharing the same pointy which is the address of the next field in the first node and then we will create a new node and allocate it and fill it with the value 5 and now the next step is to link next so inside the new node arrow next we will copy dereference head ref this is head ref dereference head ref is this value it will be copied in this next field so this will be pointing to the node holding 42 and the third step inside push is to link head which is g reference head ref equal new node instead of pointing to this node so g reference head ref will be equal to the value here which is the address of this node you can look here when push returns insert and returns and insert and the first returns we will only be with this insert and test head pointing to the first node now pointing to the node with 5 and then to the node with 42 let us check the final state and this is our final state this is very beautiful this is awesome we reached the last section in our chapter linked list which is talking a little bit about linked lists variants so we cannot talk about linked list without mentioning for example the doubly linked list which is in addition to the next field in its node has a previous pointer field and in this case every node can point to the next element and to the element before it to the previous element and let us see a quick memory state for the list one two three now our nodes have additional previous field let us see how it is set the previous of the first node is of course the null because there is no previous node before the first node the previous of the second node is the first node and the previous of the first uh, third node is the second node and so on so this is now a simple one two three doubly linked list when you deal with doubly linked list of course some operations will have to change and you have to rethink the push function and all the other operations in order to take into consideration a proper linking for also the previous field inside each node another type of linked list is the circular linked list inside the circular linked list it's like having a circle the last next field points to the first node and let us see a quick memory state this is the linked list one two three in a circular linked list the next field will not be equal to null but to the address of the first node and this is a quick circular linked list of course now if you want to iterate the circular linked list you cannot say while current is different than null because it will never be different than null so the stopping condition in your loops must be changed and you are advised to use do while because do while will be executed at least once until you reach again your head also you have to rethink of push and all the other operations when you have circular linked list this is not all because this is only the beginning there are many other linked list types for example doubly circular linked list in which each node has a next and previous and the previous of the first node is the last node and the next of the last node is the first node and you can have also linked list with random pointers which can be freely pointing to any node in addition to the next pointer and 
next course in the data structures course you will be seeing hash tables trees graphs many many complex data structure for which the understanding of the linked list is very essential you don't understand this chapter you will fail to understand your data structure course entirely so good luck in your linked list chapter and this is the summary of our chapter we saw the local versus the dynamic memories we saw the linked lists what are they we saw how to use coding over linked lists what are the operations that we may use over linked lists and what are linked list values